arsonist has webbed feet. Unique New York. Ah. What is up, Watch Fam? Happy Saturday, and welcome to this week's Ask TNH Live. I am Christian from Theo and Harris, uh, and we are live on Instagram. Can you see YouTube? Uh, if you guys do not follow us already on Instagram, I highly recommend you do. It is where all the watch porn on a daily basis happens. So that's it. Let's get into today's live. You guys ever watch this video? The guy does the clapping. Can you tell us from? <laughs> that was pretty cool. That guy was fast. All right, ready? Um, okay, first topic. Uh, actually, let's do a wristwatch check before we go ahead and, uh, and get into it. Uh, I'm wearing a Rolex 1803, a, um, uh, a white gold, actually, a white gold model. It's funny. I think that, you know, the 1803 in white, uh, you know, is the exact opposite, you know, of the day date. You know, the day date, I don't think, is defined by its function. Uh, I don't think the day or the date are important culturally. I think the point was uh, just this, you know, it was the yellow gold watch, you know, it was the yellow yellow gold, you know, you know, rich people, you know, watch. Uh, so it's funny that they produced it in white, um, be, you know, because the only, you know, the only thing that made the day date famous was absent here. And it wasn't necessarily the date, but uh, I do love the white gold day dates. You know, they're, they're really, um, I'll take a show you to you guys. They're really uh, understated. You know, they look steel, definitely. Uh, if you hold one up next to a steel watch, you can tell the difference. Uh, definitely, not only just the weight, but the color is a little bit different. You know, even like the crowns, develop kind of like a yellowish kind of patina, you know, even, even sometimes on, on, on Rolex reference 1601s, you know, my favorite reference probably of all time, the date just, uh, the white gold bezel on, on the 1601s really can look very yellow. That's happened to me dozens of times, you know, where people say, oh, if, if it was a white gold bezel, I would buy it, but too bad it's yellow gold. And I'm like, no, that's, it's, it's white gold. Um, look at it next to a, a yellow gold bezel, you'll be able to tell, but, uh, but otherwise you can't really, you know, tell all too well. Okay, so now let's jump into our to our first topic: um, damage versus patina. Um, let's let's start here. There there is no difference. I mean, you know, patina is is damage. You know, it's aging. It's it's. Uh, uh, a, you know, a physical effect, you know, of of faulty um, materials, whether that's paint or that's tritium or whatever it might be. Uh, when tritium turns custard instead of its original, I guess, whitish, you know, that's patina. Uh, when a Rolex dial begins to crack, that's not necessarily patina. It's not patina. It is damage, but it falls under that same kind of patina, you know, kind of subcategory. Um, well, what else? Um, when when Rolex dials turn brown, uh, like like the Air King, not the Air King, like the Oyster Perpetual that we posted on Instagram yesterday. Uh, you guys can see it right here. I mean, that that's patina. Um, and people ask me all the time, well, what is the difference? You know, uh, in my opinion, very simply, it, it comes down to how it looks, you know, which is, which is super, super, super subjective, uh, but in many ways it's not. You know, chocolate is a much more attractive, you know, kind of color uh, than green. You know, uh, uh, the, the brown, you know, uh, the, the, the brown dials, these chocolate dials, these coffee dials, whatever you want to call them, you know, they have a richer look than like a green, moldy, mossy look. Um, when, when your watch looks like a wet rock or looks like a, a, a stained piece of paper, it's not too handsome. Um, but when it when, when it looks like a, you know like they said a piece of chocolate not to be redundant uh, it, it doesn't as much um, the brown is just a, I, I suppose just a more attractive you know color a radium burn is another wonderful example someone just you know someone just commented you know radium burn and I'm gonna address you in a second pozo bozo but uh, uh, radium burn is a, is a great example you know when when radium hands which were utilized mostly you know in the 50s or they, they began to get rid of them in the 60s, I believe, early 60s, 64, I think with Rolex. Um, uh, when the hands remained in the same place for too long, the radium itself would, would basically stain the dial. Uh, so on the Tudor that we sold last week, uh, that was a radium burnt dial. I think it's beautiful. It's super interesting. Um, but uh, but some people like it, some people hate it. As far as Pozobo says, patina has to be uniform. Uh, actually, you're, I mean, it maybe has to be uniform for you to like it, um, but it doesn't. I mean, really, most uniform patina is pretty widely known as fake. You know, it's dyed. Uh, it, it's it's 
baked or it's coffee stained, actually like artificially patinaed if it's uniform. Not all the time, but but that's really the the kind of consensus, especially in the in the vintage you know like wristwatch, uh, the vintage uh, Rolex game. You know, if the patina looks like it was created by an artist. It probably was. Uh, I mean, look at the Paul Newmans that sold at Phillips last year. I'm not here to say that they were fake. I'm, that's not my. That's not my uh, place. Um, but I do know that so many Rolex experts do uh, and, and, and genuinely believe it and really do provide quite a bit of evidence. Uh, and really, just sensically, I mean, it does, uh, you know, logically, it does make sense. Um, it, 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 when, when a watch looks like it was actually, you know, doctored so perfectly, it probably was, you know, so that's that's interesting. Um, okay, going over to, to the next question, uh, why do you guys disable posting on your Facebook page? So let, let's take a step back and I'll, I'll kind of give the whole kind of context. Uh, we launched a Theo and Harris uh, Watch Fam Facebook page. I highly recommend you all join it. Uh, it's the, the whole point of the Watch Fam Facebook page is to post a little bit of Theo and Harris content, but a lot of content from everywhere, you know, whether that's from Hodinkee, whether that's from uh, uh, Quill and Pat, or from a blog to watch, or, or anyone. Uh, we wanna post it and engage in conversation. You know, uh, my opinion is not the only one that matters. I get comments on a daily basis that are so enlightening. Uh, that's, that's the, you know, the pursuit of those comments is exactly why we started the Facebook page. Uh, so every day we post two to four times on the Facebook group uh, just to start you know, engagement and conversation and, and involvement in the watch fam. Now this is different uh, from other Facebook watch groups. How? Facebook watch groups typically allow posting by everybody. Uh, and while that's wonderful and it's communal and it's great, I think it poses a massive, massive, massive problem as a member, as a consumer of this content. Uh, one, it's, you know, as, as a person that's not posting and just consuming, it's extremely hard to keep up with. I mean, it over, it overwhelms your timeline when, you know, the doors are open and 85 people can post in a Facebook group in a day. I don't want, you know, this watch group taking up all of my timeline. That, to me, it's exhausting. And I love watches. You know, I live and breathe watches every single day. But when I go on Facebook, I want to see watches but I also want to see beyond watches sometimes, you know? So fundamentally, I, I don't like that. Um, then as, as a poster, I think that it's very discouraging when I post on a Facebook page that allows all those postings and you get basically no engagement because you're competing against 90 other posts in a day. Uh, the way we're doing it is just, like I said, two to four posts. So every post really does get it get, get its opportunity to be in the spotlight. Every post does get its moment to you know be, uh, be the center of attention and really the center of conversation. So if we post about vintage Cartier, uh, we're going to be talking about it. You know, if we post about, you know, uh, uh, HYT, it's going to be a conversation, not just a post that gets two likes and no comments. Uh, so we're going after depth, not width. Uh, and that's pissed off a couple of people. A couple of people, I think, are being totally unreasonable about it. Uh, and, and that's fine. I mean, that, that's their prerogative. And I, I you know, I give them all the support in the world. Uh, I will always explain myself. I'm, I'm not going to ignore people. I'm not going to ban people because they don't like it. Um, but, but how can we have a content and conversation if we can't post? This is like, like this is exactly the problem. Uh, you can't make your own post. I mean, you can. We are approving posts if you look. I mean, there are posts being approved, just not every one. It's a small minority. But you can have a conversation in the comment section. That's how Facebook works. Facebook works. Post comments. That's Facebook. So although, no, I'm not allowing you to start your own new conversation every single time, and most times I'm not, I and begging or encouraging and, and really asking you genuinely to engage in conversation, you know, because I think that your input is amazing. I would never turn off comments. I don't filter people. You know, that's not my, I mean, you know, it, it's so, that's so against everything that I believe in. Uh, I'm not filtering your comments, but I think that when, uh, you know, when, when no conversation is being had, uh, you know, and there are a thousand posts and everyone feels heard, that's very superficial. You know, I don't want people to feel heard. I want you to be heard. You know, but it's two very, very different things. So no, I'm not going to appease everybody. Uh, I'm going to, um, you know, restructure the group as we have and really cause some amazing, amazing conversation. What helps a watch gain value? Rare configurations or immaculate condition? Um, here's a, this is a wonderful conversation. Um, what helps a watch gain value? Desirability, period. Desirability is the end product of so many variables, uh, and there is no formula really. Rarity can be part of it. Guess what's not rare? The Paul Newman Daytona, one of the most desirable watches on the market. 
Irregularity can be a huge, you know, uh, uh, driving force. It can also be nothing. Uh, uh, patina can be an enormous driving force. It can also be nothing. Uh, brand is always a driving force. Uh, and that's that's probably the one constant. Uh, brand and size, I think, are, are two just enormous, enormous uh, constants in, in the, you know, a, a, a collectible world. Um, really, to me, in, in the vintage world, 36 millimeters is the soft bottom for what can be collectible, and 34 is, is the pretty damn hard bottom. Um, though, so 34 is can be great, but it requires more from other variables. Uh, so for example, it takes more for a 34 millimeter watch to be collectible than it takes for a 36 millimeter watch to be collectible. Why? Because more people want 36s. More people are afraid that their wrist is gonna look dainty with a 34 on. So it's all about getting you know, the most people interested. Um, now, that being said, there are markets that can be completely controlled by a few people. That's just, that's, that, that just happens. Uh, but I'm you know, just talking about you know, the, the, the appreciation of, of, of watches you know, in mass. Um, uh, Universal Geneve pull routers, there's no real shortage of them, um, but they've been kind of made I don't want to say artificially rare because that makes it implies uh, you know wrongdoing or that implies you know hoarding, but because they are such great watches, some people aren't selling them. You know, uh, same thing I'm finding with Datejust now. They, there are so many Datejusts in the world. There is no shortage of Datejusts, um, but good luck finding a blue one. You know, again, there's not necessarily a shortage of them, but who's selling them? You, know, you bought it because you wanted it, and and now you're not going to sell it because it's not enough money. You have to like liquidate. You know, it's it's very interesting. Uh, hey fam, just want a quick what's up from Barcelona using my data. What is up Spanish Rob? Uh, you guys should all follow Spanish Rob on Instagram. He is a watch world legend. He's somebody that uh, gave me a moment of his time when Theo and Harris was like six days old uh, and someone that I will never, um, I'll never forget that. You know, I always appreciate um, that someone that had validation in the watch community took a second to sit down. So that is, it's very, very important. Okay, so that's it guys. Thank you so much for watching. I think we dove into a couple of good subjects. The Theo and Harris Watch Fam, you should definitely join and follow right now. Uh, just go on Facebook, type in Theo and Harris Watch Fam and that's it. Uh, damage versus patina. Um, ultimately, it, it comes down to your eye for taste uh, and that's really it. But thank you guys so much for watching. I will see you all on Monday.